Zone 3 Podcast. I am Robert. Yes. And I am Reggie. Reunited and it feels so good. We've got <laughs> Jesse Bashford. He is the original, the OG, if you will. You are actually our very first guest ever. Yes. Right? He yeah, trusted us. That's true. What was that <laughs> topic? You. Remind me. It was like protocol optimization. Yeah, protocol yeah. optimization. We actually, fun fact, we recorded in my dining room. And then we eventually got a studio and then we re-recorded it. But yeah. that's actually, I think, the only one that we actually re-recorded. Right. Um, you right? helped us iron out the kinks. We appreciate that. Wow. I was happy to be there. Thanks <laughs> for having me. The OG. So right. we've known Jesse for years now, right? Oh, so yeah. we've worked with him at different locations. But Jesse, if you will, just kind of introduce yourself to the audience, remind them who you are, because it has been a few years. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm a, you know, a fellow MR tech and uh, also uh, I am the department educator. Nice. Uh, where we work, so. But you're more than just that. Tell them about who you are as an individual. Yeah, well, you worked on a lot of protocol. Yeah, I mean, or... I have experience protocol building. I did that about 10 years. Uh, I have a passion for, you know, creative art. Right. And so, and that's how I always looked at it, honestly. Like, uh, it is artwork to me. So the painting was never done, basically. And I think I passion is it. a good word because you're a very passionate person, just in general, but also as a tech as well. So I think, uh, yeah, we're lucky to have you on today. Thank well, you. Thank you. Uh, every thank department you. has that guy where they're like... What the hell are we supposed to do? I don't know. Call Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's our guy. I love that. I love that. <laughs> you know. Fun fact. So we were just first introduced, what, eight years ago when I was learning GE and you're the one that taught me GE. So oh, yeah. right. I'll forever be grateful. Thank you for thank that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and then you eventually became, you know, you've done, you wore many different hats, but you were the protocol tech yeah. where you built a lot of the protocols yeah. at different facilities. That's but right. Our yeah. current facility, we work together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, MSK is kind of your bread and butter, but I, you do more than just that, right? right? I mean, uh, you know, back in the day, I spent about five years optimizing everything. So cardiac, right. neuro, MSK, uh, great experience. Uh, wouldn't ever trade a thing, you know, wouldn't give it back, that's for sure. <laughs> right. uh, then, uh, yeah, got to move jobs, went to MSK protocols and really honed in uh, MSK. But it's amazing if you have good equipment, you know, it's amazing what you can do. Right. And that's what uh, it comes down to. Yeah, right? good coils. Good scanners, good software, uh, the red, the, and good text, and good text. <laughs> uh, that's when it gets really easy and really fun, right? Yeah. You know, awesome. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. So you are here today to discuss 1.5 T versus 3 T pros and cons. So uh, where will we start on that? As far as like, Reggie, yeah. you wanted to ask a question. Well, I just it's one of those things where I think this is like one of the most important jobs as a technologist because the field is just advancing so fast. So we're yeah. constantly getting updates, new equipment, new scanners. And, you know, we want to do what's best for the patient and what's best for the radiologist to get the best reading for them. So sure. if you are at a facility that has a 1.5 and 3T, 3T is not always the best or is it always the best type you, of thing? That's know, the question we kind of get a lot. 3T is really good for MSK. Uh, you have that high signal, obviously. It right. doubles, actually. You go from 1.5 to 3T, your signal to noise ratio doubles. Um, but it also introduces a lot of artifact. Right. So when it comes to cardiac, 1.5 is still uh, the gold standard uh, from where I'm sitting. Uh, you know, body imaging, you get the artifact as well. So body could go either way. Right. Uh, I think MSK, though, is where 3T really shines. Uh, because you can increase the resolution, take advantage of that extra signal. Right. But uh, don't you always want high resolution in all imaging? I would think what, so, no yeah. No matter what it is. So why yeah. is MSK so specific to 3T? Uh, you know, because... Honestly, I would say because you can use those high coils, the high uh, density coils, uh, you have already the double the signal to noise ratio going from 1.5 to 3T. Right. Uh, so it's a kind of a trifecta, a double effect. Uh, you can take advantage of the higher resolution because you have that signal and then you can signal starve it a little more than you would a 1.5 protocol. Uh, so not only is it higher resolution, but it becomes faster. Okay. Yep. And... Where we currently work, we have a 1.5, a 3T, and we're about to get a 7T, right? Yeah. And so how do those compare as far as signal? I, mean, I think you've got a. Oh, you gonna... know what? I'm sorry, yeah. too. I know we're, we're jumping right into it. And I guess there might be a portion of the audience that might not even be familiar with what we're talking about when it comes to 1.5, Let's 3T, define 7T. It. Sure, sure, so sure. Like, yeah, what exactly are we talking about? So that's the strength of the magnet. Right. Uh, the magnetic strength. So uh, Tesla is a unit of measurement. Uh, 1.5 T is actually equal to about 30,000 times Earth's gravity. Wow. So if you think about it that way, the Earth is a big magnet, so is a MR machine. Uh, when you scale up to 3 T, it's 60,000 times Earth's gravity, so it doubles. <laughs> uh, when you go to 7 T, and it is all proportional, so now we're looking at 140,000 times Earth's gravity. So that's and just to insane. compare that, because 
as far as reference goes, we all have Magnus on our refrigerators at home. How would it compare? Uh, I don't even think you can compare those. Right. I've been yeah. told that a magnet on the refrigerator is about 50 gauss. And what okay. we're dealing with with a 1.5 is 15,000. Yeah. Three tea bean, 30,000. That's a good question. I don't have the formula for this one. but yeah. Right. But uh, yeah, you know, it definitely it sticks to the, to the fridge. So it has some pull. Well, one of my famous quotes that I had from a previous coworker, Donna was her name. But she said one time big to me, I loved Donna. it. Yeah, Donna, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, you know, like the magnets you stick to your refrigerator at home, they're about mm -hmm. 50 gauss. Yeah. Well, these magnets you can stick a refrigerator to. Yeah, that is and so I true. I love that. Oh, wow. Yeah, that is that so is true. <laughs> these magnets you can stick a refrigerator to. You could probably <laughs> stick. A Volkswagen Beetle to it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hope I can pull out an animation for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be Please great. Do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Okay. Cool. Because that kind of helps illustrate it. Right. Yeah. So you know, you can imagine uh, new projectile considerations come into play as right. you scale up the magnetic strength. Uh, there's uh, things we'll talk about a little bit later, but physiological effects. Uh, Patient heating, SAR, all that stuff goes up with magnet strength. So. Mm -hmm. Now, projectiles, that would be the reason why we're pretty much having everyone change for the MRI mm -hmm. or and just why we're so safety cautious, right? It's, yeah, all of that. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, really, uh, the, from what they wear to what's implanted in their body. Right. Uh, so uh, things that you don't see, <coughs> bobby pins, all that. Uh, so if that magnetic attractive force is higher, obviously, uh, and it extends out farther from the magnet as well, Right. And that's called uh, the fringe field? Yeah, the fringe field, yeah. Or, okay. you know, flux lines, fringe field, yep. Would you say that if it's a 1.5, it might be okay not to change versus okay, to, or, you, you know, know what I mean, 3T is okay to sure. change versus not to change? Or I think it depends on the practice, honestly, and okay. how much liability and risk they're willing to take. Right. Uh, some practices out there don't have their patients change. Uh, you know, if they're wearing cotton, that's okay. Right. Uh, but you don't know what's underneath that, you know. So if it comes from the outside, you can't really control it. Right. Uh, so the safest way is to provide the clothes that are safe to, for the patient to change into. I think that's and, big for patients. And give understand. us an example of what could go wrong if a patient were to stay in their street clothes. Uh, well, so let's just say the patient came from uh, another appointment, like a cardiac something or other, monitor test. Right. Uh, and then they changed back into their street clothes and they left uh, one of those non-MR compatible cardiac leads on them. Uh, yeah. So that will heat up if it's directly in the RF field, leading to potential burns, uh, leading to who knows what, what a lawsuit yeah. after that. Right. Uh, so, nice. so and, a, and it seems like nowadays uh, every girl wears Lululemon and me too. Though. They got men's section in there. <laughs> That's true. Right. I do you have a pair of hiking pants. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You're willing to admit that? All right. Well, if you would, this episode put a, is brought to you uh, by <laughs> yeah. Put a link on MRI safety and Lululemon because we do have patients for sure. historically who've yeah. gotten. And if you are a patient watching this, it is very important uh, t in our you know field for sure to kind of evaluate what you're wearing and if they don't change you you know make sure that you're wearing something that's 100 percent cotton but ideally if they do change you they just, they're doing it for a safety reason yeah right. everything we do is for a reason right so. yeah and on that lululemon not to you know no bad cred because this is public knowledge right uh but yeah they did have metallic fibers woven into their elastic i think right uh which ended up heating up and leading to a burn. It's a lot of sweat wicking right. stuff. And so, and actually like a consumer, just a regular person off the street wouldn't know that. Right, right. They have yeah. no reason to. Right, and Lululemon in their defense, they're not thinking of MR scans when they're building high quality yeah, clothing. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So. It doesn't have to go through the FDA for <laughs> right. MR conditions. Exactly. <laughs> so, but yeah, so uh, let's just compare 7T to uh, 3T real quick on that. Oh yeah. If you look at the 10 uh, to 99 milli Tesla range, and that's uh, the magnetic strength extending out from the machine, uh, at 3T, it's about two meters. Uh, at 7T, it goes all the way up to five meters. Oh, wow. uh, so that's a lot something right. to consider. That's interesting. So pretty much if your uh, control room MR is zone three is a little close mm -hmm. to the scanner, because yep. you know sometimes it's a little further back, then you probably have magnetized like scissors and stuff if they're like right It's very there. possible, right. yeah. Right. That's funny. You know, for that very reason, they put up those signs. Basically, patients with pacemakers can't be walking close to the magnetic right. wall, right? Or the right. wall where zone four is. Right. Uh, and for that very reason, because it extends out past, so you know, it's hard to contain. Right. <laughs> Does it affect the equipment in zone three? 
I would say at this point it would. Yeah, yeah. it would. And they would have to consider Do they what strategically plan the size of the room around that? To, I would right? hope so. Yeah. Like the I bigger the know. magnet, the bigger the room? Yeah, I really haven't been involved at that level. Mm -hmm. There's higher shielding too, I know. Uh, but you're right. Yeah, Toby, that's right? a great <laughs> question. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Active and passive shielding for right. sure. It goes up. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, what I what I would want in a 7T is a huge room. I want that thing sitting in the center of a Walmart. I know, right? <laughs> that would make me feel good about Where it. Enough? Where there's an echo? If there's an echo, it's big enough, right? That's right. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. <laughs> well, at a recent staff meeting, actually, you kind of went over um, an illust illustrations of the difference in as far as physics, safety concerns, and, and other reasons, too, why you would choose a 1.5, 3T, and yeah. how it compares, and even 7T as well. Sure. Kind of get into that for me, if you would, because I, I thought that was a great re uh, presentation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, you know, so, well, one example is T1 relaxation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it takes longer as the magnetic strength increases. Uh, so when you're talking about neuro, uh, especially T1, if you want, uh, you know, gray-white matter separation and differentiation and contrast between those, uh, you might consider a 1.5. Uh, you might consider flare if you're working a 3T. And we can take a look at some of those pictures. Uh, yeah, what, I but, mean, because you have a, a, some slides there. What number should we put up on the screen? We'll do screen on screen here. Yeah, sure. So let's see. Uh, so here you can see that's a T1 flare. Uh, white matter is brighter than gray matter. That's how you can identify that it's T1 if it's properly weighted. Right. Uh, but you can see how those uh, the gray white matter separation is is very obvious. Gray matter being on the outside and and uh, white matter on the inside. So white matter is mostly made of myelin or fat. Uh, this is what insulates those long nerve fibers. Right. Uh, so. For that very reason, you wouldn't want to use uh, fat suppression. Let's say you're looking at uh, demyelination or MS in the spine. If you use fat suppression, uh, you're going to sat those plaques right out right. post-GAD. Um, so another slide to look at here uh, is number seven. And so that's kind of a zoomed up image there. On the, on the very left is the 3T turbo spin echo. So if you try to look at the gray-white gray matter separation, uh, or differentiation, uh, it's pretty all gray, homogenous. It's hard to really tell. You can see it, though, but it's not that good. If you look at the image on the far right, that's a T1 flare at 3T. Uh, and so you can really see the contrast increases. Right. Uh, in the middle there is the 1.5 turbo spin echo. It looks better than 3T turbo spin echo. It's closer to the flare at 3T, though. Uh, so, so that's just you know one example of why uh, one five and three T it just <coughs> varies. T one relaxation time takes longer at three T. Sure. It's very noticeable when you're looking at like the spines mm -hmm. and you're doing a turbo spin echo T one, and on a three T you kind of it gets a little bit more washed out. I feel like yeah. versus the uh, one point five when it comes to how dark the tissue is. Absolutely. And, and, Mostly, I kind of at first thought it was because of the you know the TR ranges that we were kind of using, but it's probably li it's a little more than that, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely more than that. Right. So, uh, also we can look at slide eight uh, to look at CSF, right? Everything has right. T one and T two uh, properties. Um, but, I, but you're right, it is more than that. We'll get into that here okay. in just a little bit. Okay. I'm wondering because I've worked with, uh, you know, obviously we all have different neuroradiologists, and, right. and most actually per one, for one, prefer 1.5 one for neuro. For neuro, yeah, and that makes sense. I think it's this among other things. Okay. Right. Uh, I think we're on slide eight, spines, Katie. When it comes to spines. Spines, yeah. Uh, spines just look good right. at 1.5. Um, you have, uh, again, like if you take it back to the signal to noise ratio thing, a lot of your spines have a larger field of view. Right. So I always and thought so, that was more of a susceptibility thing, but you're saying it's more of like a relaxation sort of a thing? Uh, as, when it comes to this T1 contrast, yes. Uh, okay. But susceptibility also gets worse the higher you go in magnet yeah, strength. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. But uh, so if we're looking at uh, slide eight here, you look at these sagittal spines. Uh, this is just trying to prove that flare T1 is superior to turbo spin echo. Uh, image on the far left you'll see is turbo spin echo at 1.5. If you look at the CSF, it's pretty dark. Uh, the image in the middle there is uh, turbo spin echo at 3T. If you look at the CSF and compare it with the cord, see the CSF has signal. Right. The cord has signal, but it's kind of all the same contrast Almost again. Almost like a PD or something. Right. right? It does. It looks PD-ish. And, and I know this is... T1 because I looked at the parameters. Right. Um, but, you know, you could mitigate that a little bit at 3T by making sure there's two concants, maybe increasing your TR some. 
Uh, but that's really not the best way to go. If you want to see the core to 3T, if you right. look at the image on the right, uh, that's a flare. So C CSF is completely nulled right. because that's what flares do. Uh, and the cord looks really nice. You have good contrast there. So if, if there's a tech out there and they're, they're ready, I'll just like, hey, I, I need the cord darker. I need the cord darker. So mm -hmm. you recommend just go ahead and just throw a, a T1 flare? I would at 3T. Okay. Yep. Uh, definitely. Definitely. Perfect. Uh, there's really no competition here. I mean, you can tweak this Turbo Spinecco. But you might have to keep repeating yeah, it. Yeah, huh? I mean, you can probably <laughs> dial it in pretty good. I, I don't think it's worth the time. Right. Just go to flare. Uh, you know, some uh, post-contrast flare, okay, ha it has some good good and bad. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but I was at a seminar a while back, and I don't exactly remember which tumor it was, but they said T1 flare post get doesn't show a certain type of tumor. Oh. So I've always kept that in my in my memory bank. That's interesting, right? Um, but yeah, I would have to I'd have to resort to Google to find that. <laughs> right. you show like MS lesions? Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. So T2 flare is great for MS. Oh yeah. Right? That's right. Uh, and that's, that's basically right. uh, the whole that's the bread and butter of T2 flare in the brain is uh, looking at demyelinating plaques. Right. They show up white in contrast to the dark white matter. So on T2 flare, we talked that on T1, white matter is bright. Right. But on T2, white matter is dark. I know um, in comparison to uh, higher field strength, the DIR, which is yeah. a triple inverted recovery sequence, or double. <laughs> That's funny. because Double. It's a D. <laughs> but there, but there, <laughs> are, funny. there are triple. But there are triples, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, right. Yeah. But I know that that sequence is uh, because of you know, the inversion, um, it's a little heavy on the signal when it comes to how much signal you actually get, right? It's harder yeah. to actually get a good signal on those it's sequences. True. Yeah. So higher field strings play is a good uh, yeah. practice in that. Absolutely. Right? Especially at three, you know, we were doing 3D a lot now. Right. Uh, so 3D oh, volume yet. scans have uh, have more signal to begin with, but then, right. right, just take advantage. That's another reason why 3T is so nice. Right. Take advantage of that double signal. Signal. Yep. Or else you just have a really long scan, pretty much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, right. And then so, but I believe the the double IRs we're running are Turbo Spinecco based, aren't they? Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah. So we That's talked funny. about signal to noise, magnet strength. Uh, you could use this, you know, as you go up in magnet strength, you can obviously increase your resolution or reduce the scan time. That's another big thing we really haven't talked much That's about yet. That's a great point, right. Is that uh, you can you can just fly through scans. The so stronger when you, the field strength. Right, so when yeah. you get a new magnet in, yeah. right, and you got this brand new 3T, and the rat's like, all right, let me get this, whatever, Orbit's protocol. Uh-huh. You have this choice, right? You can pretty much kind of do what you've been doing on whatever 1.5 you've had in the past, or yeah. you can kind of, you know, dial it in and speed it up. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's good. You need a, a reference point. Right. Uh, and so most of us out there have started with 1.5, and then 3T came later. Uh, so, but, so I would use that 1.5 protocol as my baseline. Right. Uh, uh, take it to 3T. Uh, you, some things have to change, right? And that's just physics. Right. Uh, the precessional frequency of hydrogen protons increases right. as magnet strength increases. So uh, your bandwidth, so also the separation of protons uh, in that field changes. You need higher bandwidths at 3T to pre uh, prevent chemical shift. All right. And if we could so, just touch up on something, because you mentioned the higher the field strength, the, the shorter the scan time, right? Yeah. Um, if and programmed the, correctly, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of that would be a couple of things, right? So you got patients who have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so if we could reduce that scan time, it would, they would be, um, you know, oh, yeah. appreciative of that. Absolutely. Nobody also, wants like to be throughput, as far as facility yeah. perspective goes, you can yep. get more, scan t more scans done. Yep. Um, Fewer artifacts. Patients have less chance to move. Right. Yeah, true. Uh, yeah. And, and this is a common misconception, but scanning faster certain ways, you know, for example, using uh, fewer lines of case space, mm -hmm. it's actually going to reduce the patient heating. Oh, right. Uh, so it, it's a win 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 all across the board. Fewer artifacts, happier patients, yeah. uh, mitigating risk, all that. Right. Uh, more time to drink coffee. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, and then you would want to avoid, you know, dialing it in and going super fast on your 3T, maybe when you're doing like, I don't know, high resolution imaging? Yeah, yeah. Nerves so, and things? <clears throat> absolutely. And I just think it's good to uh, create a balance, right? Right. So it always trade-offs. Uh, you can, so if you took the 1.5 protocol, uh, what I would do, going to 3T, and we could just say this is for a lumbar spine, for right. example, yeah. sagittal T2. 
uh, I would instantly program like 50%, 15% higher matrix. Oh, nice. Uh, again, that bandwidth has to change. So if we just talk about bandwidth, uh, not by a number, but hertz per pixel. Right. That's the fat water shift. Uh, I would keep it in that probably 0.8 hertz per pixel range at 3T, uh, which is going to be a higher bandwidth than I would program at a 1.5 if I'm trying to take advantage of some of that signal right. with a lower bandwidth. Uh, but that's kind of my range is 1.5 to 0.8. If your bandwidth, if your hertz per pixel goes above 2.0, that's when you start having chemical shift issues. Oh. So keep an eye on that stuff. 0.2. Um, uh, but, and, and so, okay, so you take that higher bandwidth that you have to do because of physics. Right. From 1.5 to 3T, you're going to lose some signal that way. So, yes, signal doubles, uh, but then you give some back. Right. Uh, so, for example, like 150 bandwidth at 1.5 might come out to something like 250, 260, right. 270, something in that range at 3T uh, to be equivalent hertz per pixel. Right. Um, but then I would also drop an average. So, All right. you know, because you have that extra signal. That's true, yeah. You drop the average, you get the time savings, probably what, like 30%, Which is depending nice. on how many averages you have. But right. we're talking three and two. I never, you know, unless you're doing a finger on a 1.5 that's, fairly old with bad coils. <laughs> you really don't need four averages these days. <laughs> right. <you know? laughs> four averages, right? Right. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I would play it. And then obviously you run the scan, see what it looks like, and then touch up your painting. Right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Just get those lines in. That's right. Dude, nice. Nice. How is deep learning and all these new AI algorithms and SMS, how is that kind of played like... Uh, a factor with facilities consider or choosing between what they're going to purchase, whether it be a one yeah. five three T, because yeah, that yeah. helps with reducing scan time it as well. Absolutely does, you know, and it is extra cost. Uh, these extra features, right? Right. Uh, but that's a great topic, deep learning, because I hope that the world out there watches this and decides to buy it. Right. Because uh, just a little bit about how deep learning works. Uh, so at image reconstruction, you know, it's, there's like a sensitivity map that samples noise essentially. And at the image reconstruction, it removes the, that noise mm -hmm. from the image uh, and applies this database of how many millions of, of images, basically refills in the, the pixels, essentially, those right. noise pixels. Uh, it's like taking, so you can imagine that in my hand, right? It's an mm -hmm. old film, the noise has been removed, and then I lay it over a really crisp picture. <laughs> right. Uh, and then you have something that's just magnificent and the noise is gone. Uh, so yeah. Uh, People should pursue Just, these things. I think it's going to become mainstream. Right. Uh, essentially, you can signal starve your images down to, to bare bones. One average, uh, you know, if you're using parallel imaging, two or three acceleration factor, maybe four, uh, right. depending on your field of view, I guess. Uh, but it's not really signal based anymore at this point. And so it's taking away that art. Oh, right. Which is okay. Progress is good. I know. But, Progress is uh, good. But you can scan a knee, a, a knee protocol with five sequences in like eight minutes. Yeah. Right. Five to eight minutes now. Wow. It does. It, it does take the yeah. big, one of the biggest challenges, of course, uh, in MR is accounting for our loss of signal, right? So yeah. taking that extra noise out of the equation that jokes your signal up yep, definitely yep. makes the job way easier it does it does it really does yeah the text just getting so good right uh, and i'm all for it uh, <laughs> i'm like look ma no coil right <laughs> yeah right right now everybody's a, a superstar <laughs> protocol tech <laughs> right <laughs> um but no and there is still some things you have to to finesse right. there's no doubt about that uh but ai is the way it's the way to the future uh for those happier patients for right. the faster scans for the throughput, productivity, patient outreach, all that. Do you think with that you can get 3T quality images on a 1.5? I do. I think so. I wouldn't say you can get this. So if you have a 3T with AI and a 1.5 with AI, I don't think they're quite as comparable. Yeah. Uh, but if you're comparing a 1.5 with AI to like an older 3T without it, I would say yes. Image quality should be about the same. Right. If well, everything's dialed in. Right. And yeah. I, I feel like AI has created this tug of war because of that with, you know, trying to do an ultra low field mm -hmm. and add DL and, you know, or high field versus just kind of going high field because there's so, so many safety um, precautions we have to look out for the higher we go up. So um, it's just one of those tug of wars. But mm -hmm. at a 7T, 
is it really worth the extra signal? Are we really getting that much signal? I think 17 may be over, over signaled right now. Right. Uh, but you know, it's still in the research phase. Um, so uh, there is no, we should get into the uh, RF transmit and all that stuff. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, yeah so. Yeah, some good slides on that. For sure we should. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I would say 7T is fun and fancy and expensive. Uh, but, and I'm glad that. I guess places, versus 3T. Right. I guess, right. Yeah, I guess places out there that can purchase it, that's awesome. Right. Uh, and they're paving and the way. And I'm glad you brought up cost because I recently heard something that it, basically when it comes to cost, it, it, it's an average of 1 million for Tesla. Yeah, I think some of these new 7Ts are like $10 million. Yeah. 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 It's a lot even of higher when it comes to that, but like yeah. I'm, I'm hearing that these 3Ts are about 3 million. Yeah, that sounds about right. One yeah. five is probably 1.5 million, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. You buy a couple, you get a deal. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they've gotten a few, well, there's a few clinically approved 7Ts out there, but they still have their issues, right? They're very limited in what you can use them for. So when it comes to like the costs versus yeah. like what is actually going to be used when you get exactly. it, exactly, it's hard to vouch for that. Still. Right. Exactly. But I do think, okay, uh, going from 3T to 7T, yeah. some of the neuro stuff is going to be huge. Oh, right. Uh, because now they're finding things uh, that you like wouldn't MRAs see. MRAs like and stuff? MRAs, sure, you could see like <laughs> way smaller vessels, just the resolution in general. Uh, right. With that high signal, you can take advantage of really high resolution. Right. Uh, and you probably turn the lights on to things that the radiologist hasn't even been paying attention to. Right. Uh, you know, so if you go back to like the old 1.5s, a tumor is already formed, you know, it's <laughs> obvious. Right. I see that tumor, right. it enhances. And I think they could probably see uh, earlier cell formation, not on a microscopic level. Uh, but it's just going to be that much better where wow. they can catch things earlier. Nanometer? Maybe. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> sonometer? What's a sonometer? I thought, oh. What's a Ooh. centimeter? I know. After are, PETA, I can't, I can't go far after are, PETA. Are those interchangeable? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. I think they are, but. That's awesome. Potato, potato. So how much signal are we getting, I guess, in comparison when you jump up from 3T to 1.5 more? But we uh, kind of touched that a little bit, right? Like it's. Is it like two times more, pretty much? Yeah, so right? from 3T to 7T is 2.33 times. Right. Yeah. Right. And then it doubles from uh, 1.5 to 3T, but then again, you give some of that back with the bandwidth. And I see. Uh, I would say after the bandwidth change on your average protocol, and remember it's signal to noise ratio, it's like relative. Right. Uh, so that is relative to the way it's programmed, it's relative to your field of views. All right. Um, uh, but I think from 1.5 to to 3T, you're probably getting like 141%, something in that range. Realistically, right? Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Nice. 141.5. It's very specific. <laughs> 141. <laughs> He's like doing the calculation in his head. No, I looked this up. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, 70s, there's some trade-offs physiologically, right? That we have to look out for. So it's not oh, like yeah. we could just throw them in and it's just kind of the same as doing a 3T. It, it's exactly, some changes, exactly. right? Exactly. So, uh, you know, like the magnetic flux induced vertigo. People get uh, dizzy. You got to approach slowly, things like that. So people who have uh, vestibular issues, I know you want to see them at 7T, but they might be contraindicated depending on the severity of their situation. Right. What would be some contraindications that might be surprising to people for a 7T? Yeah, even uh, so like we're very quick to scan like metal rods in a femur. I don't think we're going to be scanning any of that stuff. I've, I've heard out there at 7T, patients start to feel pain. Right. Uh, so that's definitely contraindicated. I just found out feelings. They say we're not going to do anybody with feelings. That's good. I mean, right. honestly, we have to be careful. Right. Uh, with like 7T. A lot of the population right there. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, man. So the screening is going to go gonna be huge. Gonna right? go huge. And also, just our safety practices in general need to change to right. accommodate the complexity of 7T. One thing that you said in your recent presentation that surprised me is that it can actually affect blood pressure. Yeah, so I read, mm. uh, just doing research on this, that your systolic blood pressure in that environment, the patient probably in that scan bore, the systolic blood pressure goes up. Right. Uh, and then if somebody's like on a vasoconstrictor or something like that, oh, that, yeah. that or so, dilator, that could actually be a contraindication. That can be. And so, uh, yeah, getting into that stuff is all about like the RF energy. So patients who are on certain medications can't dissipate heat well. So uh, they heat up quick. They hold heat quick. They can't get rid of it. Well, because uh, they have to, when you get a higher field strength, they have to increase the 
the output that the RFs are putting out be for the homogeneity reasons. That's exactly right. right. That's exactly right. So uh, let me get to this slide. And I only know this because I looked this up today, but or this week, I mean. But actually, apparently, at thirty nine centimeters or uh, centimeters uh, Celsius is it's a hard stop for a oh. contraindication for an MRI oh, patient. Oh, wow! And because that's been something that's been on my radar for years now. It's uh -huh. like if a patient has a severe fever, that, that's a reason not to do an MRI, yeah. especially on a 3T or a, you know, a Absolutely. high field. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And that comes as a surprise to a lot of techs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, diabetes. There's a list of them. Right. Uh, vasodilators, constrictors, uh, beta blockers. Um, so on this topic, what really causes the heating primarily? I mean, I'm not talking about thermal injury. Right. Uh, that's separate. But what is heating this patient up? So where they're like, I need you to take this blanket off. I'm sweating. So right. radio frequencies, yes, right? Yes, absolutely. RF energy. RF energy. Yeah. And so uh, with that comes hot spots, though. Right. Uh, so because that, and I'll get to that slide here. Slide number 19. Uh, and this is just a thermal image after a shoulder MR. Uh, so, you know, receive only coils are receiving only the signal, right? They're not transmitting anything. Right. Uh, so most shoulder coils out there are this way. And so you can see that the patient had a right shoulder MR. There's some heating on the thermal map. Uh, but also the left side is hot. Uh, the neck is warm. Uh, down by the elbow on the right side is warm. And can we assume that this was a patient that had their right shoulder scan? Absolutely. Or yeah. is it sometimes the opposite because the gradient on the other side is trying to compensate for the distance? You know, it could be that. Although this, uh, because I pulled all these images from online, it, uh -huh. it did specify the right shoulder was the okay. image. Um, but you can see that it's hot, not even really at the shoulder as much as it is on the patient's side. Right. Uh, the torso there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, this is a good uh, segue into RF energy and the differences between, you know, the different Tesla strengths. For sure. Um, so if we take it all the way back to the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Slide uh, 20 here is the random movement of hydrogen protons. That's what they look like. They're in you, me, water, mm -hmm. you know, probably some in this table. <laughs> it's just a club. It's, a it's just a club. Dancing. Yeah, Almost they're like dancing. like a Fortnite everybody's, dance. Everybody's yeah. <laughs> Nobody's really, uh, you know, in line yet, right? right. It's going to come to a line dance here in a minute. Right. But exactly. on, on slide 21, <laughs> you put the patient into this, uh, as we talked about earlier. The MR machine's a huge magnet, right? Right. Uh, slide 22 will show you what these hydrogen protons do. Now it's a line dance. Yeah. And some are uh, parallel. Now it's the club in the music video. That's it, man. You know what I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, but some are parallel, some are anti parallel. Uh, you know the story, right? right? But this processional frequency that they're calling it is uh, determined by the strength of the magnet. So you might say, who really cares? Well, slide 23 will show you. So here we're looking at the actual processional frequency. <laughs> of hydrogen. And so 64 megahertz at 1.5, 128 at 3T, and almost 300 megahertz at 7 Tesla. So this is important because this increasing processional frequency is directly related to increased heating. Slide 24 will show you uh, that this RF wavelength has to change. The RF wavelength has to match the processional frequency. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. that interaction doesn't happen and you don't get an image. So, and I remember learning this. You guys probably remember learning this too. Uh, it's the same as a light wave, right? So mm -hmm. long wavelengths penetrate farther, like red light. Uh, the same is, is of, uh, of these RF energy. Right. It's the same story. Same story. Uh, so at 7T, you're trying to, to move those at 298 megahertz. Uh, so the shorter wavelength comes into play. They have higher energy. They don't travel as far. And that, on that note, uh, leads to dielectric artifacts. Oh, yes. Um, but yes. at three gigahertz, as these continue up to the gigahertz range, three gigahertz is microwaves. Right. And, and we know what those do. Right. <laughs> and in just in practical terms, when you talk, talk about dielectric effect, I mean, what scan would that affect the most? Uh, you know, that's a big one for body imaging with the CITES. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's huge. So that'd be a good reason to do a 1.5 on definitely, instead of a 3T. Definitely, definitely. Yep. And there are some ways to kind of mitigate that at 3T with the B1 filter. Right. Uh, it's not as good, though. It's not as good. Because all that ascites, uh, it basically creates incoherent waves that cancel each other out, essentially. Right. And then it's based on the diameter of the patient's abdomen, too. And water's dense. So all these things are creating uh, basically 
the hydrogen protons aren't collect, like being collected. Essentially, they're not contributing to signal, so you exactly. end up with like signal void. Because it throws off, they're out of tune at that point, yeah, right? So exactly. it throws off of what the magnet's already thinking it's supposed to be listening to. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Yep, yep. And so, and that's why. So these shorter uh, RF wavelengths, they can't penetrate deep into that water. Right. And so, seven T is worse. A dielectric than 3T and 1.5 is, is the money again. Yeah. Well, they're not even doing body imaging on 7T yet. No, no. And then the reason there is because this RF energy coming from the inherent body coil it is a big wide spray. So oh, back to that yeah. shoulder MR, the reason why he's right. hot all over the place is because it's a big wide spray of RF energy. It's not focal just to that shoulder. I see. So the RF is coming from the body coil, the inherent body the coil, inherent the magnet body itself. transmit coil. So yes, they're only exactly. using transmit receive coils then on the 7T? 7T or? only has transmit receive coils. Okay. Yep. Right. Uh, so brain and knee, and I think that's about it. Right. Yep. And whatever you can stick in that knee coil. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because even the brain coil almost kind of doesn't go all the way down, like as far as you would get from like the three T like yeah. head coils that you would see or regular head coils. Oh right. yeah, I feel like it's kind of short. Like so as sure. far as carotids go or something like that. Yeah, you're it's That'd like be hard. They, they exactly they don't extend it far at all. I was uh -huh. surprised by that. Yeah. So, and I do have a slide twenty six, uh, which kind of shows that that's normal RF energy distribution if you're scanning the chest or. Oh yeah. Um, so you can imagine that a pacemaker in the chest would get direct RF energy, uh, as opposed to being in a transmit receive knee coil, uh, the pacemaker's not getting any RF. Nice. Big shout out to Dr. Cornell, his app. Yeah. Right. We'll put a link in the description. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it is hard to, to determine, well, it's not hard. It's, it's predictable where potentially they can be burnt, depending on where the location is, right, yeah. that we're scanning. Oh right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's hard to kind of prevent it. It's hard to prevent it. Right. Uh, it is very hard to prevent it. But I feel like I'm about to give a spoiler alert because Jesse has a, a little, little trick give a little that tease. might help. Give a little tease. But we're gonna say that towards the end. <laughs> okay, okay. So make sure you guys keep watching. <laughs> That's true. I have been working on something. Now, does the acoustic noise actually go up? Yes, the acoustic noise goes up. Uh, With full strength and stuff. It like that, does. Right? Yeah. Nice. So from so one five is to three. So is there FDA requirements that like double earplugs? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or have a higher rating? I was thinking, I Reggie. <laughs> I'm sure that the actual uh, whatever decibel rating is gonna go up. Right. Uh, for protection, you know. So I don't know. Right. I don't know. 7T is so new for all of us. And, and I and do so, feel like it's be kind of interesting to mention is that Reggie's actually been put into the ISO center of a Borbo 7T. Uh, so yeah. he's experienced that vertigo. Yeah. And sure. One thing that was surprising to me as they brought him into ISO center is how slowly oh, yeah. the table moves. Yeah, yeah. we can inscription on that too. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's important, really. Right. Uh, yeah. It's probably, you, you might go cross eyed and Right. Pass out. I don't know. Like this is exciting for all of us. Right. And I can't wait to see it. Like it um, got awkward as I was going in because the tech was still right there putting me in for like twenty minutes. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was. Like, his... right. She's like, "Okay, bye bye now." Uh, and yeah. then she's still there. She's like, bye again. You know, it was like his awkward. first time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't actually turn the gradients on, so we didn't actually do any scanning. So oh, I actually represent Cambridge right now. What the hell? Oh, that's right. It's my lucky hat right here. Oh, nice. <laughs> that is nice. Sorry to interrupt. Keep going, Justin. <laughs> no, no. Uh, this is all good stuff. And so, you know, talking of that, though, the, okay, from 1.5 to 3T, uh, you'll have four times the SAR. So we haven't really touched on SAR oh, much. Yeah. Yeah, we're getting into this heating, heating right. thing. Um, uh, but, you know, SAR, specific absorption rate, is the RF power absorbed per unit of mass over time. Right. Uh, it's directly related to heating. Uh, so... Yeah, you're gonna. You saw the the short wavelengths; those are gonna be higher energy, and and SAR is gonna go up. Right. Um, and and seventy is real. And, real short. Yeah. Right. So when you go from three uh, T to seventy, you have five times the SAR with an identical protocol. Oh yeah. Uh, so you have to do something protocol optimization uh, and manipulation to to mitigate that stuff. But keep in mind that the scanner has FDA requirements, right? Right. Uh, and these requirements are across the board for 1.5 up to 7T. Uh, and that is, if so, if, for whole body scanning, this is slide 28, but uh, if you're using the inherent body transmit receive coil, the scanner can't heat the tissue based on an algorithm, right? It won't heat tissue more than 0.5 degrees Celsius or 2 watts per kilo. That's in normal mode for body. Uh, and 3.2 watts per kilo for the head. Right. 
So, so FDA takes into account SAR or B1 RMS or both? Because I'm curious. I, I would though. say both. And okay. and you see the FDA IAC, IEC International oh, yeah. Electrotechnical Commission. I guess they uh, they kind of follow the same guidelines. String. String. I don't know. Yeah, they follow the same guidelines. They work together essentially. Right. To kind FDA of put all does this what? Yeah, exactly. Right. They're in it to win it together. Right. Well, that's good. Uh, so for the tech, we just have to make sure that the height and weight are accurate. Uh, oh, if right. the protocol parameters are set in a way that it's going to cross that threshold, uh, the scanner SARS out and forces the tech to do something else. Right. You know, increase the TR, drop the flip angle. I understand why weight's important, but why is height? Does that help to determine like the BMI and then that... It is this so it's more it's BMI that's important? Well, or? I don't know that every, uh, you know, I, I, not naming names, but Siemens, GE, Philips, <laughs> Canon. Ones. I don't think yeah. they all require the weight into their algorithm okay. right. the way that some do. Uh, but I would say just for consistency, make sure the height and weight Katie are. Katie might accurate. know that. Katie, you have a mic? I think that's, I, I think, I think that's why B1R message making such a big wave. Is because it's it's just more predictable uh -huh. when it comes to the overall energy output sure. of the gradients, mm -hmm. and then you can actually like regulate for sure how much they're going to actually receive. Versus with SARS, all like afterwards you're going to get this much SAR. Well, and it can kind of predict, but it's kind of an estimate. Sure, it is where an B1 estimate. RMS is like boom, this Real. is what they're going to get. Yeah, it's after the calibration scan. Right. Yes. 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 Yeah, and so that's huge. We got episodes. That's why that I'm surprised. Too, we? Yeah, we do, and that's yeah, why I'm so surprised FDA out. doesn't lead more towards B1 RMS versus an estimate, which is SAR. I think they, it's a matter of time. And they it's may have uh, have that out there. Right. Yeah, they may. Well, you uh, know, I haven't seen any instructions for use yet. B1 I haven't RMS. Have yeah. You? Is it in there? Okay. So Katie has. FDA is getting up to date. They're okay. catching up. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> Katie behind the camera. We all know who her, but she's our MRSO, soon to be RMSE. Can I say that? I don't know. We'll edit it out if I can. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, Katie. <laughs> uh, all right. So, Sorry. nah. So, so what's next? So, okay, if we're looking at that knee coil at 7T, now they're right. using parallel transmit. Uh, so this RF delivery is coming at you from up to eight different channels oh, right. inside that coil. Uh, so that reduces hot spots that we talked about. It also right. reduces dielectric artifacts. So the knee coil is eight channel? Uh, well, so it's eight channel transmit. Okay. So that's transmit, uh, which is separate from collection. Okay. Yeah. Right. Well, the real nice part about <laughs> having an e coil like this, of course, is you don't have to worry about wrap, right? Whenever someone oh, doesn't yeah. fit into the e coil, I'm like, ah, sure, you know, because right. you kind of have to adjust the protocol if there's not one like that already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Oversampling for sure. Right. Gotta like watch that. your phase directions. Right. Uh, but yeah, so when you get that SAR pop up, there's a few things that I recommend doing. Just recommendations, but mm -hmm. uh, you really don't have a choice, right? Because you got to get it down so that the scan will start right. and take off. Uh, but I like to reduce that refocusing flip angle to 120 degrees. Okay. Uh, you can increase the, the TR, but I don't, that's not my first go-to because right. it increases time. Right. Uh, and then a lot of these scanners have uh, RF transmitter bandwidth, like uh, low SAR mode, normal right. mode. Right. Uh, and then now why? these are called RF pulse types. Oh, sorry. But yeah. I didn't want you to go too far. Why just 120? That's 120, kind of uh, what I've heard, and this is... Uh, just something that stuck with me from apps yeah. along the way is that they said you can't visually see a contrast change down to 120 degrees. Okay. And this is for turbo spinecos. Right. Uh, once you get below 120, uh, you can start to see that. And I hit uh, probably more at T1 than anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and even still, I've gone down to 110 degrees and visually can't really tell. Can't tell. Right. If you're in a hurry, you got to do something. Right. Uh, but then, you know, reduce the phase encoding steps. Oh, yeah. That also reduces the RF delivery because you're filling fewer lines of case space, and that's parallel imaging. So if it's not on, turn it on. Right. Uh, yeah. There's so and many then, tools in our belts these days. It's just it. like uh. Yep. Scissors. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. No, we do, and and that's why I love MRI, and that's why I'm passionate about it because right. you have, uh, you know, you come up with like a secret formula essentially. Right. Uh, and you build your ways of doing things and. You're great at that sharing work. that too. Yeah, so oh, we appreciate thanks, that, man. And then obviously, like overscanning, a lot of people overscan because oh, yeah. they just they want they don't feel confident in what they actually need to include. Uh, and so, you know, for an axial shoulder, for example, if you're doing three millimeters, 
we don't need 28, 30 slices. Right. Just get the glenoid. Just get through the joint space. Yeah. Get yeah. the AC joint down through the, I mean, depending on the practice, obviously. Uh, but that's what, that's what they're there for is a shoulder joint scan. Yeah. Do you think that um, technically going to 7T because of having to deal with the heating, it kind of pretty much mitigates the aspect of being able to use it to go faster? I've put some thought into this. I've done some thought experiments, right. and I don't know that the seven T is going to be a lot faster it might be than slower. three T. Right. Right. You know, because I don't know. Again, you have that T one relaxation rate, and you know, at T at three T, the T two relaxation rate, I guess, is not that much different than a one five, right? Or it's not that much of an issue. Okay. Um. So, but yeah, for T ones at seven T, I imagine if you switch to gradient echo, oh, yeah. for a lot of stuff, then you're going to get that time savings back right uh, but i just don't know i right. need to get my hands on that right on that ferrari right exactly <laughs> right. see how it drives coming soon i know um but yeah so if everything takes a little bit longer mm -hmm. and you're really trying to do this uh, at a high resolution then it might be similar to, to 3t that's right. my prediction right i'm with you on that for yeah. sure yep Will they? Will they have? Will they be tapping into? Oh, they can't because of the coils, like parallel imaging as much. I would think so. Yeah, they have and, to, right? And uh, also deep resolve. Right. Okay. They have to. Boost. Yeah. yeah. I think we're getting boost. Right. Mm -hmm. SMS. SMS. I don't think is a is a good option. Right. Because Need more uh, elements. Right. Well, yeah. So SMS is cool because it excites and acquires, reconstructs multiple slices at once. Uh, so that is like. You know, if it was one slice you were working with, then now you're working with two at the same time. Oh, right. That's a lot more energy. Right. And so, for example, axials in the long bones with SMS, it's not that ideal mm -hmm. because the SAR just goes through the roof. Oh, I see. Uh, so instead, I would use probably, uh, you know, acceleration factors, parallel imaging of right. probably three right. uh, with anything with the larger field of view, and then apply the, the deep resolve. That's going to be I key, mean, huh? that's going to be key. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is deep resolve a Siemens term? It is. And so I'm curious of the major vendors. Yeah. Do they all have a 7T out there or is it just? GE does. I know that. Yeah, uh, they do, I think. I don't know of the others, okay. but I don't know why they wouldn't have it in the works. Right. They have all the, the, you know, all they have to do is build it. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think Philips has one that just hasn't been uh, like FDA clear, like to actually sell clinically. Okay. But they have like a research one, I believe. Okay. But yep. And I do want to mention, I think that we're we're only covering one five three t seven t as yeah. if those are the only ones out there. Right. But there's low field out there. Like for example, I mean we we covered hyperfine. I think right. that's like zero Ultra. point six four Tesla oh, yeah. or something. Yeah. So there's like there's other field strengths out there. Oh, but sure. these are the main the ones. Main. If you were to right. go to ma like a major outpatient imaging center or yeah. you know a hospital, sure, it would be either a one five or a three t. And then rarely would you see a seven t. I think there's only. Um, what did I hear? What did I hear? How many 70s in the US? Not a lot. Not I think lot. about 40 to 50 worldwide is what I heard. Uh-huh. Right. So and, and then our facility just got the very first of its kind in the country. Right. Um, maybe even in the world um, installed last weekend. So we haven't right. yet, you know, started using it, but um I'm excited to start seeing those images for sure. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, so, uh, but yeah, back to the fast thing. I think if you really want to go fast. Right. Uh, anybody who's looking to buy a magnet out there. Yes. Uh, you get the 3T, get the good coils, get the AI algorithm, and uh, you could literally double your numbers. Just 30 and, minute time. And nobody's going to break a sweat. Or less. Right. It's not like you're going to be running like crazy right in the trenches like you know back in the day right <laughs> and don't worry we'll yeah. leave jesse's contact information he come and optimize you guys' That's protocols right. for yeah. you yeah be happy to <laughs> for free no, <laughs> not for free there's a yeah. fee <laughs> I, I am passionate about it yeah. but um actually I, you answered a question just now that i was going to ask you later but let's play hypothetical real quick if jesse bashford was the owner and ceo of an imaging center Ooh. and you had only one a space for only one magnet what would it be it'd be a 1.5 would it yeah with, with deep learning yeah or, with all the bells and or, whistles okay mm -hmm. or deep resolve because you can yeah. just about do anything right or... and that would pay for the 3t that i would set right next to it <laughs> you only have enough space yeah. uh, i see what you did there yeah, yeah. <laughs> see yeah you're dealing with a pro right here man. because i can scan more yeah. patients with that 1.5 yeah. for all the reasons we've been talking about right yep okay smart 
and I'd love to have one of each. Right. I know um, we've talked about RF and heating, but there's there's conductive properties and um, neural stimulation and things like Peripheral that. Too. Sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, anything conductive uh, is going to absorb RF right. energy. Uh, so that's wires, leads, metal objects. Uh, so uh, when you're scanning patients, right, you want to make sure that that coil, the cable mm -hmm. for the coil isn't looped or rested on the patient. Right. Uh, you want it straight and you know, say you could choose to go one way, like towards the head with that and plug it in or go the other way towards the feet. Choose the option that's going to keep that cable out of the RF field as best you can. All right. Uh, because, you know, if those... I would never consider that. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah, if it's directly in that RF field from that picture we showed, right. uh, then it's getting energy. you warming up. Um, for example, uh, they did experiments. I found this online, but uh, the tip of a long wire that they just stuck in there and scanned uh, the tip of that thing increased to 167 degrees oh, wow. over a certain period of time. So you can imagine if that was a neurostimulator or a pacer lead, yeah. that's going to cause tissue damage at the end of that lead. Big time. Uh, uh, and that's why device manufacturers have to set these limits. All right. And you can see now that that's why we would scan these at 1.5 and not 3T. Right. Yep. And then that's something like a patient can make you aware of, but what if it's under anesthesia, you Ooh, know? Yeah, like yeah. It, that's when it becomes scary. It's going to become very scary. Uh, I think screening is the only way. If you can't screen the patient completely and thoroughly, then it's probably not safe to scan them. Yeah. Now, peripheral nerve stimulation. We'll get into that, and then we'll jump into the final. Sure. Antenna effect stuff. Yeah, so I think I have a slide for that. You do. I saw it. Because it does increase with the field strength, right? Because yeah. the, the And we're getting peripheral nerve stimulation from the gradients. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you're exactly right, Reggie. Still got uh, so, it. <laughs> that's awesome. You never lost it, bro. <laughs> but that is slide 13. And uh, due to the stronger gradients, right? Uh, okay, let's back it up again to those hydrogen protons. Right. The resonant frequency increases, right? It takes more energy to manipulate those at a higher energy state. Right. Uh, and so those gradients have to be stronger. Uh, in addition, if you're going to use higher resolution, scanning with higher resolution requires stronger gradients. Uh, and that's nice. the whole reason why, as we know, the rapid changing of gradients right. creates that peripheral nerve stimulation right. and creates the twitch. That's right. So, so, it, so peripheral nerve stimulation can be presented in a couple of different ways, right? Yeah. Uh, so twitching is one. Can people just kind of feel like oh, yeah. beating P and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you ticklish? That That's got to be the screening form. Are yeah. you ticklish? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, no, it is, though. It, it right. is your nerves. So anything like, you know, you can imagine like electrical uh, little shocks, you know. Right. Yeah, you could feel that. Uh, uh, uncontrolled it's, movements. It's yeah. so interesting because it can kind of present itself differently depending on how the patient's kind of put together, right? Mm -hmm. Like each patient might not, you know, get the same type of peripheral stimulation. Sure. And I had a patient one time who I had to discontinue because it was painful for him. Yep. And I was just so surprised because I've never had it, like had experienced that before where someone's like, I can't do this. I, I feel the sharp pain kind of going up my, my stomach. Sure. I'm like, okay. Um, we, you know, I adjusted his position and... It was still getting it, still getting it. Every mm. time I turned the gradients on, he was still getting it. So mm. we just didn't do it. So that really had me kind of do my due diligence. And I, I, I dived in a little bit more about peripheral stimulation. It was yeah. just so interesting how it, it can present itself. But it is way worse at 3T than it, it is, is at 1.5. It is. Sure. And then we were talking about noise earlier. That Those right. rapid gradients are what's creating that acoustic noise. Right. So stronger gradients, more noise. Dang. The so, need for more ear protection. We can all, figure out how to do MRI without gradients, man. I know. <laughs> it's a billion dollar idea. <laughs> right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> they sound like one of our patients. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You Can't know, you if, make it quieter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't all plastic on the outside oh, and true. all that metal, like if they could that's somehow true. create this environment in like a jelly, right? Then I imagine Remember it would those make a lot old of noise. Apple <laughs> computers, where you could see on the inside. Are those old pagers oh, yeah, back in the nineties? Yeah. Should we do something? That would be kind of cool. That would be yeah. Cool. yeah. Yeah, it would be. It's interesting. Get on a GE, Siemens, mm -hmm. Phillips, all you people. <laughs> right. Well, so to kind of get uh, kind of into our last topic, thank you guys for sticking around for it oh, too. Yeah. Um, thermal burns and oh, you know, sure. antenna effects and things like that. Mm -hmm. How? What, what are some of the best ways to prevent it um, outside? I guess one way would be lower field strengths, maybe, like scanning on lower field strength. But what are some of the other ways? Yeah, you know, it's crazy because uh, <clears throat> you can pretty much get a burn at any field strength. Right. And so we talked a lot about patient heating and warming and uh, that RF energy. 
um, the hot spots, uh, that's one. Mm -hmm. uh, but these thermal injuries have basically been pinned down to three categories. And so inductive heating, and that's the rapidly changing magnetic fields. Those generate eddy currents, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is uh, especially like near an implant, right? Right. Uh, or, or even a wire. So an right. antenna effect is another one where the wire absorbs those electromagnetic waves. Right. Generates voltage and current, and uh, and it it's highest concentrated at the end of that wire. Right. That can burn somebody, uh, and then you, the heating of a, res a resonant loop, and that's where you have a coiled wire, even an oh, e yeah. ECG or EKG wire sitting on a patient's skin. Uh, it'll superheat and burn right. through capacitance and inductance, basically. Yeah, right, uh, right. And I'm not an electrician, <laughs> but- <laughs> Sounds good. But it's essentially <laughs> absorbing the energy and transferring it onto the patient and it's and it's too hot for our skin and, and we burn, right. so. Right. Uh, well, then yeah. you, said, you mentioned earlier how like just different scanning techniques like parallel imaging, deep learning, these different AI algorithms yeah. kind of help reduce the case space that's filled, which reduces the SAR that's Yeah, because transmitted. Time, right? right, yeah, fewer lines of case space. Yeah. Uh, so you gotta fill that whole case space box to produce an image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so as you turn on acceleration, or you know, some form of, not SMS so much as, uh, as parallel imaging. Right. You turn that on, you have fewer lines of case space to fill, so it's less RF on time to create that image. So it seems like that should be the go-to, right? I agree, yeah, and that's where I'm at. Uh, with right. Because deep learning reduces the noise, right. you can use higher acceleration factors. Uh, you wouldn't like the image without without the algorithm, uh, but it f it solves the problem for speed and time, and it's better all the way around. Way Reduce around. patient heating. Right. Um, yeah. But even then, you, even then, you can do everything you can, right? And, right. Well, at least you can do all that and still have a potential to burn. So, yeah. What other things kind of help kind of prevent that, I guess? Yeah. So, you really have to pad the patient, right? So, uh, skin to skin t contact is not good. Right. And I do have slide uh, 39 here. Skin to skin. Uh, so, so, when a patient's like laying like this. Right. Yeah. So, that's going to create uh, a loop, right. you know, which is basically, I don't know. Or if it's a high percentage right? patient, it's a conductive loop, right? right. Yeah, um, but you know, a lot of patients are doing this. Right. Right. Maple and, leaf, I don't know what that right. is. <laughs> so let me ask you: If you're seeing this picture, why yeah. why do you need to put this guy uh, was fully nude and anatomically correct? <clears throat> so I figured I'd put a leaf over him. So, uh, but it's funny you had this because just this past week I had I was not the scanning tech, so yeah. you don't you know you don't want to step on the toes of the scanning tech, and you're just here to help position the patient. Sure. So the patient goes very claustrophobic. Can I take my gown off? Oh. And I said no. Yeah. The tech said yes. Okay. Immediately, I'm thinking same as with you know thigh to thigh contact. If he takes his gown off, now yeah. his arms touching his torso. Right. I said no. That the patient that. Tech said yes. I kind of just stood back and yeah. watched how it would all fold out or, or play out. But anyway, so that's what I was taking into account. I agree with you on multiple levels here. Uh, right. Because, you know, well, first of all, they say that you need to have at least a quarter inch of, of gap. So by the books, like, you know, sheets and gowns aren't good enough. Um, but then there's the liability of having a, a, a patient with no clothes on. Right. That's not okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Right, uh, so I think you did the right thing. Well, um, embarrassingly, I did. I said no. Yeah. But I didn't stand my ground because okay. the scanning tech said yes, and then I just let them okay. do their thing. And I, and I probably should have. Well, and I told the scanning tech afterwards. Well, I said, okay. "Hey, it's the right. same as thigh to thigh contact. Yeah. You, you know, you wouldn't want them." That's why I said I didn't want to step on your toes. But yeah. that's the reason why I said no. Sure. And you said yes. Yeah. I whenever you, I don't like. Oh, right. Actually, Katie brought up a really good point. Oh, she's not on mic, but she asked what body part were we scanning? That's yeah. actually, yeah, that's a huge factor to consider. Yeah. I honestly don't remember. I mean, if it right. was a knee in the transmit receive coil. Then it's irrelevant. It's probably a mute yeah. point. What was it? Dang it. But I would he say. Let's out. just say it was a knee. Yeah. Let me just say it was a knee. <laughs> Yeah, it was a knee for sure. <laughs> well, now, yeah, now I feel foolish that I didn't even no, consider that. But no, because you said your piece, you communicated, and uh, you weren't responsible ultimately for that. But well, it, you know, ethically speaking, if you if you know something is 
compromising the safety of a patient, whether it's your patient or not, you should stand your ground. Well, but. true. That is true. You don't want to make your teammate look incompetent at the same time That's by a, challenging them in front of patients. Yeah, so it's very tough. I understand your approach with that. Mm-hmm. That is tough. Yeah, I think just speaking up is uh So is, huge. is there so FDA requirements, because you mentioned a quarter of an inch with padding, that it has to be a certain thickness? Not really. No. Recommendation. Uh, yeah, because there's all kinds of pads out there. Uh, mm. So, you know, vendors create these. The, the, the people who make the MR machines create those. Those are trustable. Right. Right. They've you know, done the homework. You know what drives me crazy with pads? Yeah. <laughs> Is that you put you you position the patient perfectly, you put the pads in. But what if you're doing some sort of tin planning where the table's gonna move a lot? Sure. Oh, gosh. And the moment it comes out, the pads fall off. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's a problem for all of us MR techs out there. Right. And and I do have a slight solution for this. Right. Uh, I'm trying to set you up. Yeah, I don't know if I don't know if it's a good time to show this. Why not? But... Let's bring it up. So actually, yeah. so if I can kind of introduce you, so if there's one word that I could describe Jesse, it would probably be passion. And when, and when it comes to just MRI and, and for different reasons, imaging, this man is, he's a Picasso and, you know, the images are his art. And so, right. um, but in addition to that, you also find safety to be a huge. Oh, yeah. Boy, you're so innovative. I think that's why you're so good with even looking at the parameters and trying to find things, you know, that will still make it work for this patient, even though everyone's else is like, what else are we going to do for this? We can't do anything for yeah. this. But you're, the way you think, it's really good. You so. guys are too kind. There's two different types of people. Right. And there's ones that always see room for improvement. And right. there are ones that are just complacent and just keep so, it moving. But... You yeah. saw room for improvement in terms of padding, yeah. right? And so you've actually got, and what's your website again? Uh, mrpadwell.com. Yeah, and you've down. got some recent, now you've got some big um, customers or clientele coming out right now that are going <laughs> to yeah. be using your pads. You yeah. actually have your own line of padding, right? I do, I do. Um, yeah. I mentioned how annoying it is when a patient's pads fall off on a table yes. that moves a lot. Or yes. like say you bring them out to give them contrast, the pads fall out, whatever. Right, sure. But um, well, I yeah, so I came up with this idea. Like we've all seen the pads, the long pads, the short pads. Uh, but but what I think, what I had as a scanning tech, right. I was tired of them falling on the floor. Right. And then for some patients, the larger patients, they sometimes don't end up where you intended. Oh them. yeah, you're like if there's to... not enough room. Right. Uh, and so what you I came... to lean in awkwardly and yeah, the floor. Right. then vomit yeah. later. Yeah. Right. And and, and they're <laughs> like, <laughs> you've all seen it where uh, in that patient where the arms they have really broad shoulders uh -huh. and oh, yeah. the pads are like bouncing on the way in yeah, and then they yeah. end up sticking. Yeah. <laughs> right. And maybe a pillowcase. Right. To yeah. help with that. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's instead of that. Lesson. I said, why don't have why don't we just have an all in one product where the pads are built in? Uh, you know, it's essentially the same material that the pads are currently made with. Right. But it, it goes across the table. Patient lays on that, and then it holds the patient's weight holds everything in place. Right. So it always ends up where you intend it. They never fall on the floor. Right. They're like the floor is dirty. Nice, you know. Sticky, right. And it's like, considerate of that minimum like padding thickness. Absolutely. Which is, yeah. yeah. So these are one inch pads. I used uh, neoprene foam. So this is the same stuff you would get in a wetsuit. Uh, so it's super uh, resistant to any sort of like thermal right. anything or electrical anything. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, and so I have a quarter inch thick. That's the base layer. That's what's closest to the MR scan wall. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have some softer foam, another half inch of that. So I actually have a, I have a half inch of the neoprene foam and a half inch of this other softer foam for patient comfort right. when it compresses uh, at like 50 pounds. Oh, nice. So, you know, you think of an elbow. Right. It's, it's not going to compress more than a quarter inch. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah. And that is the recommendation. I did my homework. I talked with the FDA. Uh, for a half an hour. <laughs> and so uh, I did the homework to see what's the safest out there on the people that have already done the testing and oh, research. Right, right, and that's right. what I found was that if the pad uh, does not compress more than a quarter inch, you could consider it very safe. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. Well, Let's see it. So it looks like this. And so as you can imagine, this would lay across the table and this is the head in. And so, and so this is the head in. So uh, the patient's head would be here if they're going head first. And even if they're feet first, this is still the head in because right. the way this is shaped is that when it comes in contact with the scan bore, it folds up around them. And oh, it's just nice. Like perfectly, uh, you know, encapsulating them here. Obviously, if the patient's got anatomy that's outside of this, 
you would have to use an additional pad. I wonder why no one's thought of this before. I know. This is That's a great it's idea. It's so obvious. It's no turning back for me. I'll never work out another scanner that doesn't have this. That's what I'm thinking. So, yeah, so I have one inch pads built in, a half inch neoprene foam, and a half inch uh, what's called AirTag foam. Oh, yeah. Uh, so there, there's no latex here, there's no none of that. And uh, the exterior is waterproof canvas. Uh, it's waterproof canvas that's lined with PVC. So, as, as far as infection control? Yeah, so you can clean these. Uh, I just wouldn't use bleach, uh, but nothing's going to penetrate this because on the other on the underside of this is actually PVC. So oh, it's awesome. plastic. Right. Flexible plastic. Mm -hmm. um, so, you can clean these with you know your normal cabicide and they will dry. Like they'll, they'll absorb a little bit of water. Talk it to the mic for me if you will. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. impossible, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's impossible. Yeah. Uh, but then on the back, because That's these good. do slip around, um, this is sewn in. So, I, and I've tested this, this will not slide on the table. Right. So if the patient sits down, nothing's gonna move. And that's that in a nutshell. Sweet. So, and then if somebody wanted to purchase these, where would they go? Yeah, so if you just go to mrpadwell.com, that's the website, I have a few products. I have some longer pads, I have some shorter pads. Nice. And my goal is, uh, and things are going well, by the way. Awesome. So I have a little bit of house money so I can keep adding new products. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I plan on getting some just, you know, like head coil sponges and foams oh, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that. Nice. Uh, Adding a little bit more of your innovation there too, right? Yeah, exactly. Nice. Exactly. And so I'd like to have just a one-stop website for all things radiology, really. X-ray positioning pads, you know, CT has some things of their own. Right. Yeah. So overall, really, uh, a lot of the big takeaways from this episode for sure is when you're looking at buying a magnet, right, you want to make sure that you're buying one that's going to suit the population that you're, you know, buying it for. So if you're seeing a lot of device patients, you don't want to probably do a 7T for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And you maybe don't want to do a 3T, right? But uh, Or a lot of patients with any type of implants, really. But if, you know, if, if you do already have a 3T, 1.5 and... 17 might be an ramification where you might be able to benefit from some of the benefits of yeah. going up a little bit higher, sure. but you might not because you just can't do so many things. Um, but it's just it's so much technology out there, right? Yeah. And really optimizing what we do for the patient with what we have mm -hmm. is the key to get the radiologist what they need sure. to move the care along. Right? Absolutely. So. We appreciate your time, dude. This oh, is amazing. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Right. You're awesome. Did we miss anything? I can't think of anything we missed, honestly. Uh, right. You know, we talked... Oh, one thing. Uh, you know, w when we're talking about burns, we didn't really close it out with... Uh, we we want to pad at any skin to skin contact. Oh yeah, uncross the legs because that's skin to skin contact. Oh, pad between the patient and the bore, because the closer those arms get to the bore, they're closer to that RF coil, and so they're getting more energy. Right. Uh, and then also in the armpit, this is somewhere you know you kind of talked about that in the thighs. Thighs and armpits are another spot that can create a loop and can create a a burn. Right. So with that, look out for those. I think right. That's all we've got. Right. And yeah. just like using maybe towels, maybe in between the legs, if you do see that their legs are touching or things yeah, like that. You know, or... All the literature says it needs to be an approved pad and it, okay. you know, that, but it, it's distance. That's what really distance. matters. So yes, if you rolled up a towel, I think that's better than nothing. Right. Uh, if the patient's wearing pants and they're not, you know, because moisture also, that water creates the conductivity. If they're sweating, yeah. uh, you know, so the pants are going to help with that. Nice. So Dude. whatever you can is better than nothing. Right. <laughs> yep. Katie. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Jesse, you're awesome. Oh, thanks, yeah. guys. Thanks, guys. Well, you're awesome. Well, I wouldn't be here if well, it wasn't whatever. You do the guest questions. <laughs> well, we've done it before. We could do it again. Yeah. It's been it a few changed. years. You All right, let's do new, this. Uh, <laughs> moment that he's proud of. Maybe. So we ask everybody mm. at the end of the episode, what has been the most satisfying or fulfilling moment in your healthcare career? Coming Every on day is three, a new right? day. Yeah. That's tough. <laughs> every day is a new day. Yeah, the we didn't prepare you for this question. Yeah, honestly, so. everything that I've done in my career has brought me to this very moment right here with you guys. Oh, uh, nice. <laughs> and so it's just each day builds on the next, right. and it just keeps getting better. So uh, yeah, ask me next week; it'll be that day. <laughs> but really, this is huge. Right. Uh, you guys have started this podcast. It's awesome. You've Thank outreached. You. I think one of your episodes had like 100,000 views. Yeah. Did it not? Yeah, we're pretty much famous. You know, You're pretty I'm much famous. <laughs> <laughs> and for me to sit here amongst the likes of you right. is the pinnacle of my career. You're so funny. Well, we, a lot of our audience, so this is a good point, a lot of our audience is newer technologists too. Do you have any advice for people maybe who haven't taken the board or who's just getting into the field? Yeah, I would say if you're passionate about 
about what you're doing. Just right. study. Like, I don't understand the people. This is just not me who can do a job for eight hours a day, seven days a week for 42 years and not understand what they're doing. Right. Right. So if you just take an interest, whatever it is, it doesn't have to be MRI. Right. But take a genuine interest. Take the steps. Learn the stuff. Uh, you're going to be better for it. Right. Everything's going to be easier. Uh, and your life is just going to be better overall and right. more fulfilled. Right. Be proud of what you do. Be proud of what you do. I mean, yeah. You probably end up being that, that Jesse character in your facility. Nah, you guys are <laughs> way too nice. <laughs> <laughs> way too nice. All right. Well, cool. Thank you again, Jesse. Thank you for everyone who's watching, liking, and subscribing week after week. We appreciate you guys. I think that's it. Zone 3 Podcast. We are out. Out. Good.